um, so I'm pre presenting the work on a smartwatch, and I can track my user's arm. And this is a joint work with Hu Wang, my lab mate, and Rom Roy Chowder, my advisor. So understanding human arm motion contains, is divided into two tasks. The first one is to understand how the arm moves. And the second one is to know the meaning of that arm motion. So we often call the second task gesture recognition. So by applying a classification over arms movement, rotation, lifting, and so on, we know whether the user is running, eating, drinking, or doing other daily activities. And nowadays, this classification can be easily applied to a smartwatch. The first task, the first task which is to track how human arm moves, this is often called posture tracking. So posture tracking means to break down any arm motion, such as shooting a basketball, into a sequence of arm postures and the 3D placement of the arm. So arm posture tracking can enable a much larger range of applications. For example, natural user interface, motion gaming, all these are possible with arm posture tracking. And sports analytics, they can be very fine-grained. And in healthcare, we need posture tracking to monitor the, the patient's physical motion. So in this paper, we ask this question, can we track arm postures with just a smartwatch? To answer this question, first, we have to understand what is inside a smartwatch. So the motion sensors inside the smartwatch contain many three sensors, the accelerometer, gyroscope, and the compass. The accelerometer measures the acceleration in its three axes, x, y, z axis. And the gyroscope measures the rotation around the three axes. And finally, the compass measures the projection of the north vector into these three axes. So having these motion sensors, what do we want to track? We want to track arm postures. So assuming that the shoulder point is a fixed point, we define arm posture at the combination of elbow location, wrist location, and wrist rotation. So your elbow can move on a sphere around your shoulder, so it has two degrees of freedom. And similarly, the wrist can move on the sphere around your elbow, which adds two more degrees of freedom. And finally, the wrist can also rotate around your forearm. So this adds the fifth degree of freedom for your arm postures. So now the question is, from these motion sensors in the smartwatch, how can you track this arm posture? We did a couple of experiments. So the first experiment we did is called dead reckoning, which is also known as double integration. And the idea is this. At the first step, we try to estimate wrist orientation, where we define the wrist orientation, which is the same as smartwatch orientation, as the rotation angles around its x, y, z axis. So the procedure is this. First, we integrate gyroscope values. We have one estimation of my wrist orientation. And second, I combine my accelerometer and the compass together. I have another estimation. I fuse these two estimations together so I have a better estimation of what my wrist orientation should be. And the second step is to use this wrist orientation to help me project my accelerometer data into the global frame of reference. And once have, we have that global wrist acceleration, I can integrate once to get velocity, I can integrate twice to get location. And if I already have my wrist orientation and wrist location, getting my elbow location is very easy. And let's see some results. So this figure shows the error for tracking wrist orientation. We will see that the error is OK. It's almost constantly below 10 degrees over time. And this figure shows the error for tracking wrist location. The error goes up quickly, even more than 100 meters away within one minute. And this implies that because of the errors in the MEMS sensors, double integration won't work in an unconstrained space. But we know that arm posture is not unconstrained. Actually, because your wrist can only move around your elbow, you cannot reach your wrist as far as you want. And this constraint is already built inside our definition of arm postures. So why not we do this? We see these sensor data as our observation, and we estimate these five degrees of freedom as our five unknowns. And we use the existing state estimation algorithms to track these five unknowns. So in working toward this direction, we found that when defining our state space, we have to not only incorporate the posture itself, but we have to include the differential of the postures and the second derivative of the postures, such that 
we can incorporate the gyroscope and accelerometer data into our observation uh, space. And this makes our state, de uh, state space dimension 15, which is too large for a uh, state estimation algorithm to work both efficiently and robustly. And this implies that we need to find some way to help us re reduce the search space. And let me tell you an interesting finding that indeed reduced the search space for us. So imagine, for some reason, you cannot rotate your wrist. You cannot change your wrist orientation. For example, assume your forearm has to point upward and your palm has to face towards yourself. Now try to move your arm around. And surprisingly, you will see that there are not too many places where you can bring your arm to. And actually, if you plot where your elbow might be as red points, you will see that the places that your elbow might be is only a small point cloud that is a subset of your entire elbow sphere. And similarly, if you do that for the wrist, you will see that your wrist point cloud is also small. And it is a simple shift of your elbow point cloud along your forearm pointing direction. And this observation is true for each and every wrist orientation. And that makes us super excited because now it seems for a fixed wrist orientation, the arm posture space is quite small. It's only this small point cloud. And we already know that we can track wrist orientation pretty well. But there's one question. How can we derive this wrist orientation to point cloud mapping for each and every wrist orientation? To get that mapping, we have to look into how human arm moves. So any arm motion is essentially controlled by two joints. The first one is the shoulder joint, which is the ball and the socket joint. It has three kinds of rotational motion, which we denote here as three joint angles. And each joint angle has its own range of motion. And similarly, the other joint is the shoulder joint, which has another two rotational motions, we denote here as the other two joint angles. So actually, these five joint angles determine your arm posture. So your elbow location, your wrist location, and your wrist orientation, they are nothing but a function of these five joint angles. What we want to know is what's the relationship between these variables. Actually, from the form of, from the form of these functions, you will see that they are having a many-to-many -many mapping. But once you fix your wrist orientation, then for that orientation, it is a one-to-many mapping to the elbow and the wrist location. And if we try to realize this one-to-many mapping by enumerating over all possible joint angles, we get exactly the mapping that we want to get before. And let me just show you a brief demo of how the point count changes as my smartwatch tracks my wrist orientation. So it seems that this point cloud looks to me quite small, but I want to understand how small are these point clouds. Do they actually effectively reduce the search space for me? So what I did is this. I pick up each and every point cloud. I computed the area of the point cloud versus the area of the whole elbow sphere. Then I compute the fraction of the ratio, and I also draw the, a CDF of the ratio. And it turns out, in the median case, the point cloud only covers 8.3% of the whole sphere that your elbow can move around. So what happens if I do, if, if I do this? Because these point clouds are already small, if I simply pick the average point of this point cloud and say, hey, this is my estimation for my elbow and wrist location, I just use the average point, what will happen? We actually did the evaluation. And it turns out, if I simply use the average point, in the median case, the error for my elbow and wrist are roughly 12 and 13 centimeters. Just to give you an idea of how accurate this is, the average arm length is 50 centimeters. So the result is not bad but we are definitely not satisfied with that. Just imagine if we are doing a punching gesture and your wrist orientation doesn't change at all. And then, so your point cloud doesn't change and the average point in the point cloud will also change, will also not change. So that is definitely not what we want. And here, the core question is, now assume we have a sequence of elbow point cloud that may or may not change as time goes by. Can we pinpoint the correct location inside the point cloud, such that if we connect these locations together, this sequence of locations 
will most likely be the true sequencer location that my elbow is moving around. How can we pinpoint that location? Let me tell you this from a very high level point of view. So first, as what we did in that reckoning, we estimate the risk orientation and use that to project my accelerometer data into the global frame reference. But then, instead of doing double integration, what I did this. I used this wrist orientation to help me understand how my forearm rotates around my shoulder. And I get my wrist to elbow relative rotational acceleration. Now I have these two accelerations. I computed their difference. Their difference is exactly the elbow acceleration. And this elbow acceleration should tell me how my elbow moves within the point cloud. So in physics, we know that the differential of location is velocity. And the differential of velocity is acceleration. This means that if you give me two locations, I can compute the velocity for you. If you give me two velocity, I can compute the acceleration for you. So if we combine two locations together as one state, and another two locations as another state, then my computed elbow acceleration should tell me how possible it is to transit from one state to another. And this implies a hidden Markov model and Viterbi algorithm should tell me the optimal solution for that. So just for the simplicity of explanation, let's assume that now I have a sensor data sequence which has t time steps. And at each time step, I have a point cloud that contains n possible elbow locations. So now I group two locations together as one state. And I do this at each and every time step. So now I have a sequence of states and from each state, I can compute the velocity. And between two states, I can compute the theoretical acceleration that should be if I transit from one state to another. But of course, I also computed the elbow acceleration before, which may not be the same as this theoretical acceleration. And I assign a Gaussian error probability to their difference. And this Gaussian error probability serves as my transition probability from one state to another. And I simply set the initial probability and the emission probability as a constant. So now I have each probability ready. I can use Viterbi algorithm to decode the elbow location sequence for me. And let me show you the evaluation. Now using the hidden Markov model and the Viterbi decoding, instead of doing the simple averaging, we have pushed the accuracy. Actually, we have reduced the error from 12 and 13 centimeters to roughly 8 and 9 centimeters. And let me show you another demo in which I'm writing letters in the air, and the red line shows t neck ground truth, and the blue dash line shows my tracking result for my wrist. So we will see that although this reconstruction is not perfect, these two trajectories matches pretty well. So before I conclude my talk, we have to talk about the limitations of our system. So first, we have to know the user's face interaction. The reason is because my smartwatch will tell me my wrist orientation in a global frame of reference, but I need to express my arm postures with respect to my body. And we need to know the, the user's face interaction to do that rotation and the projection. But doing that with a smartwatch is not easy, and that is one of our future works. And the second is that we are assuming the user is standing stationary. Actually, if I start moving around, my body motion will pollute my smartwatch accelerometer data and it will reduce the accuracy of our system. And the third one is the speed. So the hidden Markov model and the v v decoding is known to be an offline algorithm, and it is, it is quite slow. And, we, and we, try to, we want to improve the speed of this system in the future. So let me give a brief conclusion. We implemented a, an arm posture tracking system that uses the motion sensors in the smartwatch to track arm postures. And we use and refuse the observation from human arm anatomy and the IMU sensor data into a hidden Markov model, and we use the Viterbi algorithm to decode the elbow and the wrist location. And finally, we achieved roughly eight and nine centimeters error for both the error and the elbow and the wrist. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Thanks.